Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Baker Institute today for this very special event. My name is Julian Yao, and I'm a senior studying economics and political science. And I'm also a lead, I'm, I'm also, I'm also a, a current member of the leadership team here at the Baker Institute Student Forum. Before we get started today, I'd just like to take a few moments to speak with you about the Baker Institute Student Forum and what we're about. You know, etched in front of this building are the three words, statesmen, scholars, and students. The Student Forum is the student arm of the Baker Institute. We bridge the gap between the student communities and the fellows, the civil servants, and the distinguished guests of the Baker Institute. On Wednesday evenings, we gather to discuss issues that affect this country and around the world, and examine the different policy implications that arise from these topics. Throughout the school year, we host multiple different events. Earlier this semester, we had an inspiring discussion with Alec Ross, Secretary Clinton's senior advisor on innovation on the topic of e-diplomacy in the 21st century. Just a few weeks ago, we hosted a debate between the Rice Young Democrats and the Rice Conservative Forum. Um, to many, including myself and the ambassador, the debate was actually more informative than the actual president, the presidential debates themselves. Um, and today, we're very lucky to be hosting the three-time Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist Thomas Friedman. But all these events would not have happened if it were not for the unwavering support of the Baker Institute. From the director, Ambassador Dirigian, all the way down to the student forum faculty sponsor, Joe Barnes, and events assistant, David Martin. I know I speak on behalf of everybody at the Baker Institute Student Forum that we are very, very grateful to have this opportunity to work this close with the Baker Institute. Not many undergraduate college students around the country can say that they work with a top-notch public policy think tank on an everyday basis. So for those of you who are here today that are not involved with BISIF, get involved. We're, we have the entire Baker Institute supporting us. And with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Ambassador Dirigian, the founder, founding, founding director of the Baker Institute. Ambassador Dirigian's career in the Foreign Service spanned through eight different administrations, holding the different, multiple different positions in government, including the ambassador of Syria and Israel. He is a leading expert in the complex political, security, economic, religious, and ethnic issues of the Middle East and South Asia. He has played key roles in the Arab-Israeli peace process, as well as the regional conflict resolutions to this very day. A true civil servant, Ambassador Dirigian has propelled the Baker Institute into the global spotlight as one of the leading think tanks around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Dirigian and Mr. Thomas Friedman. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you, Baker Institute Student Forum, Forum, Baker Institute Student Forum members. Uh, it's truly a great honor for me to introduce our guest speaker. I think it's about the fourth time that Tom Friedman has been here, and, and we really have been very blessed and honored that he is giving us his, his scarce time. Uh, as Julian mentioned, he's the winner of three Pulitzer Prizes, and uh, I think he's going to write a book, you know, his famous book, uh, From Beirut to Jerusalem. His next book, I can confide in you, is gonna be From Washington to Houston. Uh, his uh, writing spans topics from globalization to climate and energy to the Middle East. He is, I believe, our most insightful uh, commentator and analyst of the crucial trends and issues of the United States and the world and we're very happy that he could join us today for a brief discussion of these issues. I want to give you a little inside joke. Uh, the highest praise that I have received was an email from Tom Friedman a couple of years ago when right after the publication of an op-ed I wrote in the Wall Street Journal on the year 1979 being the year of the Ayatollahs in Iran, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and the attack on the two holy mosques. And I get this email from Tom, said, Dear Ed, you SOB, I was about to write an op-ed on this and you preempted me. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, students of Rice, the Baker Suit Forum, join me in welcoming warmly Tom Friedman to our podium.
during the short time we have, I'm going to ask some questions and ask for your opinions on them, and then we're going to open it up to the students for their, uh, for their uh, questions to you. Um, we've just had a very significant presidential election. Uh, certainly the electoral college vote was decisive, but the country by the popular vote is pretty evenly divided. And uh, how do you see the current policy making environment facing the president from your very central vantage point in Washington? And, uh, and is, there, is there a real possibility, do you think, for bipartisanship as we go forward on attacking all these critical national and international issues of which you've written extensively? Well, I thank you very much, and thanks to the um, uh, steering committee here. It's a treat to be here. It's great to be here with you, Ed, um, one of my favorite and I think really uh, treasured public servants we've had in this country. So it's great to be here. Great to be back at the Baker Institute. Uh, next question, please. Um, no, uh, so, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very big, uh, there's a lot of layers to that question. So let me, let me start, first of all, uh, at the political level. As anyone who reads my column knows, I'm, I'm you know, if, if, if I have a political affiliation, I think it would be called conservative Democrat. You know, I'm, I'm a, um, uh, I was a Bill Clinton sort of DLC Democrat. Um, the DLC Democrats were a product of Democrats losing um, uh, four out of five national elections. There's nothing like losing a national election to get your party um, to be more disciplined. Um, and it was Bill Clinton who moved the Democratic Party really from the left to the center left. And that was a huge, huge. move. Um, uh, I believe the Republican Party is going through a similar transition now, um, uh, moving from the far right to the center right. And um, there's nothing like losing an election to make that happen. Right. Um, I think what ailed the country during the last four years were many things, but one is that um, uh, we needed, we desperately needed a conservative opposition party. Um, but we did not have a conservative opposition party. We had a radical opposition party. Because a conservative opposition party would say, um, climate change is real, but we need market-based solutions to deal with it, not regulatory ones. Um, uh, a radical party says, climate change doesn't exist. A conservative party would say, um, we need a balanced approach of taxes and spending $1 in tax increases for $10 in spending cuts. A conservative party would say, a radical party would say, not even a dollar mm -hmm. in spending cuts for $10, in dollar in tax increases for $10 in spending cuts. So I think the Republican Party, because of just a complex of events, got itself into a, a corner, mm -hmm. basically. And this election, um, uh, by the way, on immigration, a conservative party would say we need a legal pathway to immigration that's stringent, coupled with controlling our border, and a radical party would say we're just not going to do this, okay? You should self-deport yourself. So on, on all these key issues, the Republican Party um, it was, was no longer a conservative party. It was a radical party, and it needed to be smashed, um, uh, and it was. And I think now you're seeing um, the fully absorption, the full absorption of that reality. It's incredibly healthy. Democrats had to go through it. The Republicans are going through it. And I think we're going to end up with much more center left, center right, uh, people making decisions on both sides. But it's, before we get to a budget deal, um, there's going to be a civil war in both parties. Mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be a civil war in the Democratic Party because there's going to be spending cuts and President Obama has never really had that conversation with his party. Mm -hmm. He's talked about it, you know, but never really had that conversation. There are going to be tax increases. And you know, Boehner hasn't really had that conversation. He had private negotiations with Obama. But, so there's going to be blood on the floor here um, uh, in both parties. And I think we're in for a very wrenching, uh, destabilizing, um, fascinating, if you're a reporter, um, uh, period here. We're at point A. We're going to be at point C. I can assure you of that in a year from now. But um, how we get there, I can't tell you. And whether it's after we go over the fiscal cliff or before, um, after there's blood on the floor or not, after there's a financial crisis or not, that's all what's being decided right now. Mm -hmm. But we cannot play an effective role in the world until we get our economic footing back onto ourselves. And so I think this is very important. Let me ask you, Tom, 
as you well know, character is virtually everything in leadership. And in order to achieve what you've just said, and I agree with your analysis, uh, the character of our leaders is really important. The president in the first instance, but the Republican leadership, the Boehners of the world, whoever's going to come up like Paul Ryan. Both of them have to have the character and the leadership traits to make those compromises. And that, I guess, is a question mark. Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're all going to be tested. We're going to be tested as citizens, and they're going to be tested as leaders. Right. Um, because if we wanted a different election, or been, and hopefully that was part of the message here, I, 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 my view, I like to put things in a very simple way, and I think Obama won. Um, uh, I think for one reason, very, at the end of the day, um, it's because Mitch McConnell said four years ago, we think our number one job um, is to defeat you as president. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he could have qual he qualified it and they changed and they negotiated. But I haven't think Obama won because a majority of the country said, I think that guy's trying. And I think that guy's not helping. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna, despite the fact that the economy has 8% unemployment, I'm gonna give that guy who I, looks to me like he's really trying one more chance, because I think that guy really wasn't trying to help. And so this is a test for Obama, and it's Absolutely. a test for the other side. Yeah. But I think that's what it was about. You know, there's all these erogenous issues. He got the right Hispanic vote, the right women's vote, the right left vote, the right you know, gay vote, the right, right environmental vote, the right green vote. It's all of that. But at the end of the day, I think Americans are very practical. They, they, they drew a, just kind of a basic conclusion. That guy's trying to fix the problem. That guy looks like he's trying to stop him more than really trying to help. Going to give that guy another chance. I agree with that. You've written extensively, Tom, on the uh, issues of education and job creation and the so called the new economies. Yeah. And you've done some real, very important insights. You've contributed on that. And so you've said that this is one of the greatest challenges facing the country is responding to the changes of technology, globalization, and markets, reducing uh, a, d a decent. Uh, wage, middle skilled jobs. What actions can the new administration, along with business and universities, take to train workers for a rapidly changing uh, job market? Well, you know, you know the, the most important thing, and of course you alluded to this in terms of your student debate, that we didn't, you know, the most dangerous thing for a country or a species um, is to misread their environment. Species who misread their environment tend to go extinct, and um, so do countries. And so I, I think it's always really critical to start every day by asking a very simple question, what world am I living in? What are the biggest trends in this world? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we don't do that enough as a country. You know, the Air Force has a concept that we teach fighter pilots in, um, uh, in top gun school, and it's called the OODA loop, O-O-D-A. Stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. And what we teach our fighter pilots is if your OODA loop, your ability to observe, orient, decide, and act, is faster than the other pilot, you will shoot them out of the sky. Mm -hmm. If their OODA loop is faster than yours, they will shoot you out of the sky. Mm -hmm. Well, what's true of pilots is actually true for countries. And our OODA loop in this country has been kind of busted, basically. Because that's not how we start every day, observing, orienting, deciding, and acting. I mean, in terms of the national conversation. Um, I mean, we're not gonna have a national conversation about an affair that our CIA director had. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, here's a guy who, it's just sort of weird. I mean, we lost one general, you know, basically to a rock and roll interview um, because his staff were talking about, saying bad things about the president of the water cooler. And we're about to lose the CIA director. Every day actually orders drone attacks on people. We have no idea who they're killed, how, because he seems to have had a private affair, you know? So that's kind of weird to me. Um, but there you go, that's what we're <coughs> gonna have. That's our OODA loop, you know, mm -hmm. basically going off in a jag. So if I were to say to the young people here at Rice, you know, what is the most important thing we should observing and orienting? And that's shaping your world and reshaping your world. I think it's uh, the fact that the merger of globalization and the IT revolution, something I've written about a lot, um, has fundamentally gone to a new level in just the last six or seven years. Um, I believe we've actually gone from a connected world to a hyper-connected world, and that this is a huge inflection point, but it's been disguised by post 9-11 and by the subprime crisis. So we aren't really talking about it, yet all of us are living it. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm very sensitive to this, because in 2004, I sat down to write a book called The World is Flat, arguing that globalization and the IT revolution had merged in a way that was flattening the world and making us all connected, so we could compete, connect, and collaborate in whole new ways. Last year, I did a book with a colleague of mine, Professor Michael Mandelbaum from Johns Hopkins, um, uh, called That Used to Be Us, uh, uh, How America Lost Its Way in the World It Invented and How We Can Come Back. And the first thing I did in 2011 when I sat down to write that book was actually got the first edition of The World is Flat off the bookshelf. Mm. And I cracked it open to the index, looked under A, B, C, D, E, F, F, A. Facebook wasn't in it. Mm. So when I was running around the world saying, the world is flat, we're all connected, Facebook didn't exist, Twitter was still a sound, the cloud was still in the sky, 4G was a parking place, L LinkedIn was a prison, Applications were what you sent to college, and for most people, Skype was a typo. <laughs> All of that happened after I wrote The World is Flat. So what does that tell you? What it tells you is just in the last six or seven years, we've actually gone from a connected world to a hyper-connected world, and from an interconnected world to an interdependent world. These are huge differences of degree that are differences in kind. What does it mean that we went to a hyper-connected world? It means that if the whole world were a single math class at Rice University, the whole global curve just rose. Why? Because every employer in a hyper-connected world now has cheaper, easier, more efficient access to more above-average software, above-average uh, uh, computing, above-average robotics, above-average cheap labor, and above-average cheap genius. And that, to me, leads to the central most important socioeconomic fact of our time and your future, which is that average is officially over. Mm -hmm. Average is over. If all you ever do, they say in Texas, if all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you ever get is all you ever got. That is, as they say, N-A, no longer applicable. If all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you'll ever get is no longer all you ever got. You will get below average. To put it in more concrete terms, the high wage, middle skill job has disappeared or is rapidly disappearing. Well, there still will be high wage jobs, but they will only be high skill jobs, okay? There will be no such thing in five years as a high wage, middle skilled job. The high wage, middle skilled job was the foundation of the American middle class. It basically started disappearing in the 90s, but we took care of that problem by feeding ourselves steroids. And those steroids were, we gave people who were high wage, middle skilled, we gave them hammers and nails and we told them to build houses or build shopping centers or work for the gap in retailing, okay? So we injected ourselves with steroids to get through this period. And now the steroids have been taken away and we are left with the stark reality that the high wage, middle skilled job has disappeared and we live in a world where average is over. I have daughters 27 and 24, and I always tell them, girls, when I grew up, when I graduated from college, I got to find a job. I got to find a job. You will have to invent a job. That's the biggest difference between me and my kids, you and your kids. Well, you won't have to invent your first job, probably, if you're lucky, but you may want to. But you will have to invent, reinvent, and re-engineer that job as long as you're in it. Alvin Toffler said this like 20 years ago, and it's n more true today than ever that the new literacy is no longer reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's the ability to learn, relearn, engineer, and re-engineer what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That is the new literacy. The world is not the least bit interested in what you know. The world is only interested in what you can do with what you know relative to someone else anywhere in the planet now. So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, very easy for you to say, Mr. Smarty Pants, New York Times columnist. Um, no, let me tell you about my job, okay? Because I became the New York Times foreign affairs columnist in January 1995. And I inherited James Reston's office in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times. You're too young to know, but James Reston was a great columnist and editor of the Times in the 60s and 70s. And I suspect, I suspect Mr. Reston used to come to his office every morning, that office that I inherited, and say to himself every morning, I wonder what my seven competitors are gonna write today. 
and he personally knew all seven. Walter Lippmann, Mary McGrory, Stuart Elsop, Joseph Kraft, Tony Luth. <laughs> I know them, okay? Now, I do the same thing, really, I do. I come to the office every morning, and I say, I wonder what my 70 million competitors are gonna write today, okay? <laughs> I've got 70 million competitors. Some of them are in this room, okay? And don't think I'm not aware of it. A year ago, I was in India, I did a column. I was down in Jodhpur, I did a column. At, I was invited down there by the president of IIT, Jodhpur IITs, or India's MITs, as I'm sure some of you know. And uh, I went down to IIT Jodhpur because IIT Jodhpur had just invented a $39 iPad. Okay. By the way, one of the features of the hyperconnected world will be radical breaking of price points, where a product goes from $400, not to $350, $300, but $400 to $39.95. Now, this has none of the beauty or functionality of the Apple iPad, but is a simple wireless teaching device that every Indian could afford with government subsidies and a few rupees every month. It was quite amazing. They had been, there was a bid by the Indian Ministry of Indi Education who could produce this at this price point. IIT Jodhpur did it. Two electrical engineering professors there, one of whom came from a village in India with no electricity. So I went, I went down there, I saw this device and uh, wrote about it. I did my Sunday column in the New York Times about it. My Sunday column in the New York Times moves online about 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Saturday night. Sometime between 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Saturday night and 8.30 a.m. Sunday morning when my readers would have read it, someone in India went into the comment section under my column and posted the link to a laboratory stress test of the device I had just written about. Now, if you don't think that doesn't keep me on my toes, Fortunately, this lab test supported my excitement about this uh, $39 device. It might not have. So before my readers have even read the column, someone in India has posted a lab test about the device I've written about. Mm. I was in Beirut in 1982. It took six weeks for the New York Times to wash up in Beirut by ship. I could write whatever I wanted about Arafat, okay? And unless somebody in New York called him on a scratchy long distance line, did you see what Friedman wrote about you? Who, Friedman, 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 no Friedman, who's he work for, the New York Post, no, the New York Times, unless that happened. Now, you write your column, and it moves online, and before your readers have read it, someone has posted a lab test commenting on it. So I'm, I'm, I, I can't mail it in. I hope I never did, but I, I am under the exact same pressure that everybody else is. Average is officially over. Everyone's got to find their extra, their unique value contribution that will justify why they should get a job and hold a job. Excellent. You've also written extensively, Tom, on China, mm -hmm. where undergoing, the Chinese are undergoing now a major shift in their leadership, a 10-year <clears throat> shift in leadership. What you very well know Deng Xiaoping started in the latter 70s uh, has revolutionized the Chinese economy and the society. What is your prognosis on the Desynchronization, if I could use that word, between the political leadership of a communist party, authoritarian government, and a vibrant free market economy that is being created in China. So, um, you know, let's put this in again, start from 30,000 feet, go back to our hyper connected right. world. One of the, I think, features of the hyper connected world is that the whole concept of developed and developing countries is going to disappear. There'll just be two kinds of countries um, there'll be HIEs and LIEs high imagination enabling countries and low imagination enabling countries. That's gonna be the division in the world, I believe. Because you see, if I just have the spark of an idea now, if I have the spark of an idea, I can actually go over to Delta in Taiwan and Delta will design spark of an idea for me. I jump over to Alibaba and Hangzhou and my friend Jack Ma, he'll actually get me a cheap Chinese manufacturer to manufacture this. Then I skip over to Amazon.com and Jeff Bezos to do my fulfillment and delivery and gift wrap it for Ed for his birthday. I go to Craigslist to get my accountant and Freelancer.com for $19.99 someone will do my logo unless someone for $19.50 will do it. They're all commodities now except 
that. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the exponential value of this is going up every single day. So it's all about, is your country, your university, your institution, is it valuing this, nurturing and enabling this? So China's dilemma, it seems to me, is China's macro dilemma, is China's got to get rich before it gets old. They've got to go from two sets of grandparents and two parents, all saving for the Mac laptop of one kid, to one kid paying the nursing home bills of two parents and one grandparent. So that's going to flip very quickly when you have a one-child policy. The only way to do that is if China gets rich before it gets old. The only way China gets rich before it gets old is if it goes from a low-wage manufacturing economy to a higher-wage knowledge-based service economy. And the only way it does that is if it unleashes innovation. And the only way it unleashes innovation at scale is if you stop censoring Google. Because anything that interrupts this mm. is a proxy for interrupting imagination, okay? So that to me is the macro challenge China has. Now, China's had a vacation from us for 10 years because since 9-11, we took all that energy that we would have focused on trying to start a war with China and we applied it to Iraq, okay? So um, basically, all that kind of negative, hostile energy went toward the Middle East. And so China had a free decade where it didn't have to worry about human rights, opening, whatnot. So they made massive economic liberalization and opening and no political reform under Hu Jintao. That's how we'll remember this period. Now Hu Jintao's gotta come in. He has gotta catch up. He's gonna have to make more political reform and he's gonna be the first Chinese emperor who has to reform China politically in a two-way conversation with the Chinese people in a conversation with 400 million microbloggers on Weibo. So he's gonna have to do more political reform in a two-way conversation. Because mm -hmm. we all live now in a world of two-way conversations. That's the meaning of a hyper-connected world. I didn't have commenters on my column 10 years ago. That's right. I'm in a two-way conversation now. Someone can write under my column if they want a column that challenges my column. I'm in a two-way conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, Putin and Medvedev, they thought they were in a one-way conversation. One day, Putin said to Medvedev, you know, we told the Russian people, we actually decided, you know, six months ago that I'm gonna switch jobs, and I'm gonna become president again, and Dmitry here is gonna become premier. So the Russian people said, oh, really? You're in a two-way conversation now, pal, mm -hmm. and we're in this conversation. Mm -hmm. So that's what the meaning of the hyper-connected world is. Everybody now, is in a two-way conversation. So it takes a very different kind of leadership. It takes a leadership that inspires, enables, nurtures in a very different way from top-down command and control. Excellent. You wrote a terrific, in my view, uh, column Sunday in the New York Times, My President is Busy. Would you explain that a little, why you wrote that column and what the major message is? Um, so there was a column basically about uh, a lot of Israelis were asking me whether um, they thought President Obama would punish uh, Israel's Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu for the fact that Netanyahu and his chief financial backer, Sheldon Adelson, the casino magnate, um, had backed Mitt Romney during the election. And the theme of the column basically was that um, Israelis should be so lucky. Uh, they should be so lucky that Obama will feel he has the time, energy, and inclination to spend another two years wrestling with Bibi Netanyahu. Um, uh, but in fact, that is not, I think, very likely. I think my message to Israelis was, you're home alone, my president is busy. Um, and uh, basically stop focusing on our election and start focusing on your own election, which is January 22nd. And if you want a different American policy, then we need a different partner, basically. So, um, you know, I, I do these uh, columns. I, 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 I act out every once in a while, you know, um, as a columnist where I just, you know, uh, kind of let things rip um, uh, in order to um, uh, get people's attention. What, what, what's basically happened on the Arab-Israel question is that the whole political spectrum has moved so far to the right that someone like me, who's fairly centered on this issue, is now considered almost in, in the left stratosphere 
uh, basically the Republican Party decided under George W. Bush that it was going to make Israel a wedge issue, it was going to out Israel Democrats. That created an arms race with Democrats on Israel, so the Democrats then moved to the right. Um, and then that combined with uh, the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court that made money basically unlimited in politics, which gave a huge exponential increase of influence to the Israel lobby because they could designate basically which candidates should get money and which not on the basis of were they pro or against Israel. That moved that to the right. And that then moved the whole US government to the right because you also had a very far right Israeli government and, and where um, people in government felt intimidated stating the most basically banal things like settlements are an obstacle, obstacle to peace, sort of basic it became almost impossible for someone who wants to rise up and be a senior diplomat. So you ended up with all these milquetoast diplomats going out to the Middle East saying nothing. And you end up with the stalemate you've got. So people like myself who still have an independent basis to talk about these issues um, uh, use them. And I continue to use them. And uh, uh, I, I think I have a very centered view on this. I don't know whether Israel has a Palestinian partner for peace. But I do know that Israel has an overwhelming interest to test, 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 retest, and test again every day, whether it does. And um, that was the theme of the column. Uh, Syria, I call the problem from hell. There's no easy solution. Uh, we've seen an incoherent opposition, a brutal regime that you and I knew from our early days in Lebanon and Syria. The father, Hafez al-Assad, put together what has proven to be one of the most resilient, autocratic, dictatorial, mukhabarat regimes in the whole region. Uh, yet it's a human tragedy. Uh, I've talked about perhaps a Serbanica moment coming in Syria. One could argue, hasn't that already happened, mm -hmm. with at least 36,000 people dead. But Tom, how do you see international policy toward this incredibly difficult so it's a very tough question, and, and, and again, I'll start at 30,000 feet. If you look at the world, if you're coming from Mars and looking down on that part of the world, what you'd see is two things happening side by side. One is the European supranational state is breaking up, and across the Mediterranean, you see the Arab nation state is breaking up. Mm -hmm. So that's what's happening if, at the very, very macro level. Now, as you said, these were all basically Muhabarat states, that is, states that were built around multiple intelligence services that um, ensconced the regime in power and protected it. Um, uh, they were all minority-led regimes in one way or another, either ethnically minority or political minority or just my family minority. Um, and so my, my view on Syria is that I understand where a lot of American policymakers are coming from. They, they're so tantalized by the idea of flipping Syria from being in Iran's camp, a, a Shiite-led, or Alawite-led, it's a Shiite offshoot, minority regime ruling over Sunnis, to be a Sunni-led, mm -hmm. um, ideally pro-Western regime in the Western camp. And they're just tantalized by that. And what they remind me of is Republicans who thought they could win Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, I think flipping Syria is fool's gold, just as I thought Republicans taking Pennsylvania is fool's gold. And therefore, I think we need a negotiated solution. I'm a big believer as a journalist that things are the way they are for a reason. And you always have to listen. You know, the most important lesson I've ever had as a journalist is understand that sometimes the news is in the noise. The news is in everything that's being shouted and said. And sometimes the news is in the silence. It's in what isn't being said. And learning to appreciate, respect, and listen to the silences, it's a big part of our job. And there's a lot of silence in Syria coming out of certain members of the Sunni community, mm -hmm. all of the Alawite community, mm -hmm. all of the Christian community. And what that tells you is that this regime is hanging on by brute force, mm -hmm. but that brute force is attached to the will of certain communities that are deeply afraid right. of what happens if you get a Sunni-led regime. And um, I think we have to, uh, to me, everything, you know, I read yesterday that we've organized the Syrian opposition in Qatar, you know. My, my motto in the Middle East, you know, is that the Middle East only puts a smile on your face when it starts with them. 
Camp David Peace Treaty started with Egyptians and Israelis. Oslo isn't called Oslo for nothing. It started in Oslo between Israelis and Palestinians. Americans didn't know anything about it. Anbar uprising in Iraq started in Anbar. It had nothing to do with the surge. Because when things start with them, they're owned. And when things are owned, they become self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. And when they're self-sustaining, we don't have to be doing it. My feeling is any sentence that begins with I or we in regarding the Middle East, that's a dangerous sentence. Mm -hmm. I want to know where, what the rest of that sentence is. So when I read that I and we, you're speaking about people of the State Department are organizing the Syrian opposition, mm -hmm. that makes me very uncomfortable. Why does the Syrian opposition need us to organize themselves? And um, I, I just, there's something inorganic about that. Mm -hmm. And so I think the only solution to Syria is a negotiated solution, mm -hmm. um, unless you want to go the Iraq way. And the Iraq way is you have to own the whole space. Mm -hmm. And then you turn the whole balance of power upside down. And see, what America did in Iraq, it was the geopolitical, geostrategic equivalent of falling on a grenade. We went into Iraq, we pulled the pin, Saddam, the blast came and we fell on it. And we took the whole blast. That's true. Okay? And because we fell on it, the Iraq war never spread to Iran, to Syria, to Jordan, um, to Turkey, as it easily could have, because we were there to sort of you know, cushion it. Um, then what we did is, um, through a series of incredibly maladroit steps, we triggered a civil war. Some of it was inevitable because we changed the power structure. We said, now, Shiites are going to run this country. They're the majority. And Sunnis will be the under, under, uh, underclass. And there was naturally going to be a civil war because both sides had to test one another. What you got? What you got? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's what you got? Yeah. Holy yeah. mackerel. OK. Uh, so it took about two years of that until they got exhausted, until the Sunnis understood they were losing. And they gave up on Al Qaeda. They decided to side with us. That created the possibility for a new social contract. We spent two more years trying to forge that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in between, you know, going out and trying to you know, take on the really baddest guys. Um, it took 4,700 lives, 20,000 American wounded, tens of thousands of Iraqis, a trillion US dollars. And all that bought us a lottery ticket. And the lottery ticket says, you have a one in 10 chance of this having a decent outcome. So when I read people saying about Syria, we need a no-fly zone. Mm -hmm. We need a humanitarian corridor. My answer is, will the ends, will the means. You want a different Syria? Iraq just showed you what it takes. It takes a, a mediator who comes in and basically mediates a whole revolution in the balance of power and falls on the grenade. And the reason no one's doing it in Syria is because everyone saw what happened in Iraq and now it's not you break it, you own it. It's you touch it, you own it. I don't even want to touch it because I don't want to own it. And this really worries me because the explosion is happening. And as I said a year ago, Egypt implodes, Libya implodes, Yemen implodes, Tunisia implodes, Syria explodes. It goes out. It won't go in. It'll go out and if no one falls on the grenade. So no one wants to fall on the grenade, not certainly Barack Obama. So you got two choices. One is the Lebanese option. You just let the fire burn for 15 to 18 years until people get tired, and then they reach a new consensus. I lived through the first five years of that. And, um, uh, or you come to the Russians, come to the Iranians, Absolutely. everyone, is, and say, we're going to have a negotiated deal here. There's going to be power sharing. The Assad allies are going to get this. The new guys will get that. They'll work it out. Otherwise, this thing is just going to burn on and on and on and spread to Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan, Syria. It'll destabilize the whole region. Good. Well, the floor is now yours. Please raise your hand, say what your name is, and ask our distinguished guests whatever questions you have. There's a microphone here, so gentleman there. Yeah. I have. I have Three snowball questions please, for you. Please. The, the first one is, with the lack of response from the Israeli uh, leadership to the 2003 Israeli, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the Arab Peace Initiative, right. is Ben-Gurion turning over in his grave? Two, we already have a theocracy in, in Iran, and Israel seems to be moving the same way. Mm -hmm. Will the world demand that we have a nuclear-free Middle East? Mm -hmm. And the third snowball I got for you mm -hmm. question is, 
Well, you're going to run for mayor of New York. <laughs> thank you very much. I live in Bethesda, Maryland. So <laughs> I, uh, thank you very much. Now, I get my aggravation um, playing golf, so, but I really appreciate that. Um, I, uh, I really like what I do. Um, I, I, don't, I don't worry about Israel becoming a theocracy because um, there's still quite a secular majority there if you look at the makeup of the parties. Um, but I do worry about um, uh, an increasingly anti-democratic or non-democratic or undemocratic drift that, that can happen there. Um, and you see it with Lieberman's party you know, now merging with Netanyahu's to form a, a new uh, kind of right-wing bloc. Because you know, Lieberman, is a, he comes from that, that segment of Russian Jews who really, when they think democracy, they think Putin, not Jefferson. You know? And um, that, that I find is very, very worrying. Um, uh, I was intimately involved in the Arab Peace Initiative um, since I did the interview with King Abdullah where it was unveiled. Um, and uh, um, I, I think it was a tragedy that it wasn't pursued at the time. And uh, I think it was a huge mistake, not only by Israelis, uh, but also by uh, the U.S. administration, which didn't pick it up and totally run with it. Um, one in a long, long list of, uh, of missed opportunities. So uh, thank you for that question, those questions. Yes, the lady here. Hello. Uh, my question is, in your opinion, what is the biggest piece of news and silence today? Say it again, I'm sorry. What? You talked about news and silence. So what, are, in your opinion, is the biggest piece of news and silence today? Oh, the news and silence. That's a, that's a really good question. Uh, oh, I'd have to think about it. You know, I, mean, you know, I, I think that, it, speaking about our own country, um, it's that our, I think our people are nowhere nearly as divided as our politicians make it look like, and our politics makes it look like. And I think this election is, is proof of that for me. And I think most Americans feel as citizens like we're parents of permanently divorcing, like we're the children of permanently divorcing parents. And I think people are just tired of it. You know, they just want to run out of the house screaming. And um, I think the biggest stimulus the country could get, if you picked up the paper tomorrow, and you heard that John Boehner and Barack Obama had gone off to Camp David for the weekend and come back with a bipartisan deal that's gonna make both parties feel good and make both parties squeal. I think the stock market would go up 5,000 points. You know what I mean? Not, without even the substance, but just changing the mood. I think somebody's been sitting on the country's mood button you know, for like six years. And if, if these guys would actually get off that mood button just the idea that we're, we can work together to solve big problems. Because we, don't, we only have big problems now, we don't have small problems. And we can only solve them together. And as a country, we need to do big, hard things together. We used to be able to do big, hard things together. <clears throat> right now, it feels like we can't do big, hard things together. And until unless we can get back to doing big, hard things together, it's gonna be very difficult to, um, uh, I, th I think, get where we go, and I think that that's where the silence is in this country today. Okay. Uh, um, the Arab Spring has obviously brought the promise of more democracies to the Middle East, but these are a lot. There's also the fear that these democracies, run by kind of a more Islamic majority, will trample on the civil rights of others and stuff like that, and use Sharia law. And we've even seen Islamization in Turkey, sure. kind of the model yeah. democracy of the Middle East. Are these compatible things? Obviously, in the United States, we have ways to protect minorities, but these democracies seem not to. I was just wondering your opinion on It's a very these. good question. It's a very good and important question, and we're, we're really, we're, so, we're, we're trying to figure that out. They're trying to figure that out. So, you know, Isaiah Berlin famously wrote about positive and negative freedom. He wrote about freedom from and freedom to. So, excuse me, the Arab awakening itself, the overthrowing, the toppling of all these dictators, many in power for decades, was a manifestation of freedom from. Okay, we really want freedom from these forces that have been constricting our lives economically, socially, politically. Um, but Isaiah Berlin also wrote about freedom too. And freedom to, freedom to do things, freedom to speak my mind, freedom to run for office, freedom to organize a party, freedom to start an NGO, a women's group, freedom to realize my full potential. That requires frameworks. You know, you, it's not just about freedom from, mm. but you need to construct civil society frameworks, constitutional institutions that protect, enable, and empower my freedom too. So the Arab world now has moved from the first to the second. When you move to the second, you now see that actually there are three different 
people want to use their freedom from to pursue three different agendas. One is the Islamist agenda. It says, I, I want you know, freedom from him in order to have the freedom to live a, a life based on Sharia and Islamic law. It's one school. Uh, you have another school that says, um, uh, I want freedom to uh, see the ascendancy of my tribe, sect, or clan. Okay? Um, and uh, we're, we're seeing that struggle play out in Syria a little bit. That I'm, I'm, now I'm free to have Sunnis take over. You have a third school, which I think actually is the majority school, but again, speak about the silence. And um, that is, I want my freedom to live as a citizen. Live as a citizen with rights and responsibilities and the ability to vote people in or out on the basis of their qualifications, not on the basis of their ethnicity, religious beliefs, or, or et cetera. I happen to think that the kernel uh, that drove the original Arab Spring was all about the first. It was the, the desire to live as citizens. But um, uh, it was, use whatever verb you want, hijacked, it was uh, diverted, uh, because the people who wanted to live as citizens, um, like progressives all over the world, um, they have really good um, feelings, but they tend to be busy because they lead lives as professionals and whatnot. And um, they also tend to disagree over niggling things. And so they never got there together, okay? And um, uh, not in Egypt, not in Syria, not in Libya, not in Yemen. And um, as a result, the people who did have their act together were ready for this moment, either the sectarians or the Islamists, have been able to take this freedom from and drive it to their freedom to. And I can't tell, I think we're first in the first inning of this, because you know, if you look at Egypt, for instance, we're seeing the Islamists in power, and I think all in all, all in all, they've been pretty smart, actually. I mean, I don't think they've, they've done anything yet as we sit here today, you know, that you'd say is utterly disqualifying, you know. But, um, the real test of uh, an Islamist regime is when it loses an election and does it vacate power, you know. And so, um, you know, I, I really think though in Egypt we're going to see an interesting test because political Islam in power in Iran is political Islam in power with oil to buy off the population and all the contradictions. Political Islam in Saudi Arabia is political Islam in power with oil to buy off the opposition, the contradictions, and drivers so all the women can't drive. What you're gonna see in Egypt is something we've never seen before. Political Islam in power in the Arab world without oil. That is going to be pay-per-view, okay? Because um, uh, there's nothing to buy off the contradictions. So there is a chance here that you could see the actual modernization and reformation of Islam in Egypt, and there's a chance you could see its exact opposite. But <coughs> Egypt being so central to Islam and Arab Islam, and Arab Islam being so central to Islam globally, what's going on in Egypt today is hugely important. And I'm focused on that more than anything else. And how we get in place the constitutional pillars because what we know about political Islam is that where political Islam is evenly balanced by other political forces, it tends to take a liberal route. Where political Islam is in power unbalanced by institutional and other political constraints, it tends to take a conservative route. So I think that's what we should really watch in Egypt. But we're in the first inning of this. Okay, that's fine, that's good, that's okay. Okay, then we'll go to that table over there. Uh, and Jim, we should... We, then uh, we uh, have, the, yeah, yeah, we have just so about five Jim. more minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. I'll repeat the you, question. You have to leave at 1.20. I, yeah, I mean, I gotta, I'm supposed to go to the airport, but I can stay till 1.30, you know, so... Yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah, so, yeah. Okay. This will be the last, last question. question. Yeah. Two questions. Now, in the latest election in the U.S. by uh, Asian Americans, 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 Interesting, yeah. Now, uh, if you look at the Arab uh, world, you see the majority under 25. So some people try to frame this as uh, an intergenerational friction. Yes, conflict. interesting. Uh, what, what are your views on this, and how will this play out? Good question. Um, I think that, um, I think this was a youth-led rebellion. 
and again, I'll, I'll go back to, I was in Tahrir Square for the revolution, so I had some firsthand experience of it. And to me, um, you know, this, it, it's very clear, at least, what, 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 what drove this were um, uh, young people living in a flat world, understanding and seeing how everybody else was doing and realizing they were living in contexts that did not enable, empower, or allow them to realize their full potential as young men or women. I think that's what creates revolutions. I'm living in a world I see how everybody else is doing. And I always thought, you know, in his own way, President Obama may have lit the fuse on this, in his own way, and I don't want to exaggerate this. But I go back to, I wrote this when Obama gave his Cairo speech. I said, you know, I, I wrote this four years ago. I said, I bet there's some Egyptian sitting in the audience saying, he's dark-skinned, I'm dark-skinned. His name's Barack, my name's Barack. His, his middle name's Hussein, my, my middle name's Hussein. His grandfather's a Muslim, my grandfather's a Muslim. He's president of the United States, and I can't even vote. Somewhere in there, a fuse got lit. You know, and, um, and not necessarily by that event, but events like it. And so to me, the Arab Spring was about three, three things. It was about dignity, uh, from living in a flat world and understanding how people were living better than me, even though I think I have the exact same potential. It was about justice, living in a deeply unjust political context, a rigged game. And lastly, it was about democracy, you know, sort of in the broadest sense if I want to be able to run my life. I don't want to be passed down like cattle from one guy's father to his son. So I think all of those really you know, came together to light this fuse. And I think it was driven entirely by young people. Unfortunately, it's been hijacked. Um, uh, or, I don't know, hijacked maybe not the right, it's been, it's been taken over by people at a different agenda than the original people who drove this. Very common in revolutions. But we're in the first inning. My feeling is, this is the rest of our lives. Just as the previous era was 50 years, kind of one kind of political order, now we're seeing the unraveling of that and building a new political order. That's gonna take many, many years. And um, you know, I, I, I look forward to chronicling it. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for coming, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.